So, in today's lecture I would like to uh, discuss about the applications of industrial byproducts and the sub topics would be what are the applications different you know in contemporary world or contemporary application of science and technology what are the applications of industrial byproducts followed by fly ash which I am sure most of you must have done already you must be aware of followed by silica fumes and uh, rubber tears which I think you were discussing or you were talking about in the previous lecture. Then followed by the glass uh, mostly formation of aggregates using glass which is very contemporary concept and followed by dread material. Remember I have included only the materials which are being produced in bulk and uh, the at national level as well as international level the issue is how to deal with them, how to handle them, how to store them and overall management and then ultimately how to use them. So, these concepts are not very uh, new, but then what was done let us say 15 years back or 5 years or 10 years back and what people are thinking in today's world uh, there is a shift. So, I would like to uh, discuss about this aspect also what used to be done and what needs to be done and what is being done. So, these are three stages of the waste handling management program. So, dredge material we have already discussed in the previous lecture and then followed by need of characterization, why characterization of the material is very important and uh, any material for that matter you know whether it is geomaterial or the man made material. So, when we talk about industrial byproducts we consider them as man made products, man made resources. So, this itself is a shift you know which has happened in last few years. Earlier the whole strategy was to dispose them of fine, but in today's world the whole strategy is about how to utilize it as a resource material fine. So, this is a major shift. So, before we start talking about the you know applications of the material we have to understand what are the major issues which are staring at us. So, that we should know you know what is the real life scenario. So, I have listed down few <coughs> issues which are becoming a challenge to the mankind and these issues are dealing with the application of industrial waste as a geomaterial. The first one is you have to identify application clear. So, I am sure you must be aware of this strategy that if you are trying to borrow soils it should be from the nearby area it cannot be transported from 300 400 kilometers. So, the first idea which comes to the mind is if I am trying to find out the application of a material I should identify it for what purpose I want to use it. The second one is what are the key properties of this industrial byproducts or the waste products are essential. So, for that application what are the key properties that you have to list down. Then this is followed by the environmental sustainability. I think I gave you this idea in the previous lecture that the whole strategy of utilizing the waste material or the industrial byproducts in today's world is that we should not leave any legacy you know getting carried forward to our great kids, great grandkids who will curse us that these guys have not left anything for us. So, environmental sustainability is becoming a very big issue and this was the concept on which my PhD scholar uh, Pratyusha she worked. So, if you are interested in knowing more about the environmental sustainability you should read the paper by uh, J V P Pratyusha and myself and present day Gandraj is working in this area. So, he is talking about environmental sustainability applications of industrial byproducts. So, that we can talk about the sustainability and based on this concept I have brought most of the industry uh, most of the 
ministries under one umbrella. So, I have a project where about 12 to 13 central government ministries are working together, Ministry of Steel, Ministry of Mines, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Environment, MHRD and Ministry of Coal and so on, Ministry of Steel uh, and Ministry of Mines also. So, all of them have created a consortium and this is where we are trying to work on you know some time back I told you that whatever the byproducts are coming out of the industries, how to use them in the most sustainable manner. Then once you have identified an application, you have clearly mentioned what are the key properties which are required, then you are talking about in environmental sustainability. The next stage is I should create laboratory protocols. So, I should develop some protocols first of all testing methodologies, see the methods are not available with us to get the parameters. As an engineer or a technologist, I will like to obtain parameters which can be fitted in let us say software. So, the question is how, how, how are you going to run the software unless you have the parameters and for generating parameters either you have to do the laboratory test or you have to do the field test fine. So, this comes back to the same square one. So, you have to perform laboratory tests to generate data or to develop the protocols of testing. And then once this has been done, you will like to model the engineering behavior, how a system responds to a certain situation. It is a big series of activities. <coughs> and then we talk about the constructability and the field performance, fine, where we would like to see a project you know how it is going to behave, how the settlements are going to take place in the long run, how lateral deformations are going to occur in the long run and so on, how pore pressures develop in the system over a period of time. So, all these things have to be monitored and then million dollar question is constructability. I might do something in the laboratory, but then whether this can be you know taken to the field or not is a big question. So, all of you who are into research or who are going to be in the research, the first question is you might do wonders in the laboratory or on the paper you know in the form of a software, but whether these results can be delegated to the field conditions or not is a big question. So, this is where somehow we are lacking, we are not given much emphasis on how to use the laboratory results in the field situations. So, constructability becomes a very big issue and how the system is going to perform in the field over a long duration itself becomes a big question. So, this is where we talk about the long term performance, you know. I think we discussed a lot about long term performance. So, environmental geotechnology basically deals with how a system is going to perform in the hundreds of years. If you are dealing with radioisotopes 2000 years, 5000 years and so on. So, we do not talk about the short term phenomena. Then the question is what type of protocols you are going to develop so that you can simulate you know response of the material quickly accelerated modeling. So, all your accelerated modeling come in the form of long term performance of the material. So, like in case of concrete you have some tests RCPT is it not rapid chloride penetration test you must have done it. So, if I want to understand what is the durability of the concrete I expose it to carbon dioxide. I expose it to different ions and I force these ions to go through these concrete blocks. So, if you are working in the offshore environment where the you know lot of diffusion of chloride ions or sulphate ions may occur in the chlorides in the in the concrete, then these type of studies become very very important. So, long term performance is becoming a big question, how would you do it and in imagine in our geomechanics, we have never given serious thought to long term response of the material. Disintegratability we have not talked about, long term permeability test we have never done. Normally, our tests correspond to only 72 days at the most 3 weeks and so on. But now, we want to realize how the system is going to behave in years. Can I do accelerated models which will predict the response let us say after 50 years, 20 years so on. So, this is where we have to keep all the regulatory constraints under control. Now, regulatory constraints are the constraints which are normally uh, provided by the monitoring agencies. Like in our country, we have you know Ministry of Environment, 
and climate change. Then we have most of the councils which have these type of constraints at taluka level, village level, city level and so on. International level you have US EPA, United States Environmental Protection Agency or you might be having only EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, clear. At atomic level we have different watchdogs, we have IAEA, International Atomic Energy Association. So, all these agencies what do they do? They create regulations, these are known as regulatory bodies. So, AERB in our country, Atomic Energy Regulatory Board of India, uh, they have an office in Bombay near Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Chembur. So, from here they regulate the entire process of how various industries which are using radionuclides are controlling their process. And then ultimately as I said sustainability becomes a very big issue. So, regulations are there. But unfortunately, sustainability does not get reflected in these regulations. So, what we have to do as a scientist technologist is we have to imbibe sustainable issues into the regulations which are existing in today's context. So, this is a big job. So, the moment you go to parliament to create maybe norms, they will ask you whether you have protocols, have you tested this, have you created this, what will the response in 50 years. So, these questions you have to answer before you amend these rules, you know, which are already existing. So, this is a big work which has to be done by all of you. Now, what sustainability means? This is what was done by Pratyusha, my PhD scholar. Now, so she has developed this slide and uh, as per our understanding, a sustainable development is something which completes a cycle of its generation and its disposal. So, one of the examples would be you have geo environment and geo environment because of mining activities is becoming polluted, clear. So, from here we have written geo environment to mining because of extraction of minerals. You are polluting it in the process of processing these minerals which is an industrial activity, clear. So, mining is an industrial activity which produces industrial byproducts, clear. And what these industrial byproducts are doing? They are being accumulated everywhere in a big heap form. I think I had showed you some results. And then, if they are very unsafely disposed in the environment, their effects are going to be tremendous, fine. So, the question is can we process these byproducts? See, industry has done the processing of the minerals and whatever is left behind like in the previous days discussion which I showed you, the coal has been washed, but look at the type of chaos which has been created by creating the coal residues. Now, we do not know what to do with the coal residues. Similarly, any industrial process which produces industrial byproducts, the question is can we process the byproducts? Now, this is where nobody is ready to invest money. The biggest problem is there is no one who is interested in investing money on the processing of byproducts, except for maybe cement industry. So, credit should be given to them. What do they do? They take GGBFS, blast furnace slag, and they pulverize it, they make it powder and they mix it with cement, and then they create PPC, Portland Pozlana cement. Clear? So, from OPC they have converted into PPC, and all of you know the PPC has different properties. Setting time will be very high, but the gain in strength will be extremely good. So, depending upon my requirement, I can process a material. So, in today's discussion, my efforts would be more to show you how different industrial byproducts can be processed, and this is where the R&D is involved. Clear? And ultimately, this R&D leads you to entrepreneurship. So, people should come forward; they should adopt these materials and they should you know establish facilities where the processing can be done and after processing this becomes a gold, it can be sold in the market. So, one of the applications of the processing of industrial byproducts which we identified as geotechnical engineers was can we put them in the ground, 
fine. So, this is what Dhanraj is doing right now. So, we are trying to use the industrial byproducts in such a manner that stabilization of in situ soils can be done. And fortunately, he has filed a patent and he has a paper and all these things. So, this much work has already been done. So, we are showing that you need not to insert chemicals into the ground and the byproducts if used properly with a proper combination of different admixtures would be a big boon to do implementation at the site. And this project was implemented at the uh, site very close to the place where uh, Asia's largest reclamation work is going on in the sea. So, with this philosophy what we have done once we have sent back the material into the ground basically this completes the cycle you know during the process of mining we unearth the material and then ultimately we are putting back the this is a philosophy. So, her thesis was basically dealing with this philosophy every PhD has to be a philosophy. So, this was the philosophy of how to utilize the material so that the sustainability cycle can be completed. Hope you agree with this. It is a good example you know of sustainability. You can create your own definition of sustainability depending upon the material on which you are working. So, I am sure you must be aware of pozolon. So, pozolons are nothing but you drop few drops of water it hardens because of formation of aluminosilicates. So, all of you are aware of the name has come from a place in Italy which was known as Pizzoli. So, we call it pozolon because of the name of the place. Indian equivalent of this material is surkhi. So, in the villages what do they do? They will add surkhi which is nothing but the ash with some lime and their motor is ready. They will put some cow dung into it, it became a biogeomaterial is it not. So, the best possible combination is use cow dung, ash, little bit of calcium. And then this is the best possible mortar which can be used for making low cost houses. This is what they do in the villages. Clear? So, this is where you know I create a slight philosophical parallels between the two situations. We have natural volcanoes and sometimes we have man made volcanoes also. Can you guess? See, this is a natural volcano, is it not? It erupts. Then lava moves out all the suspended particles which are in the air, they settle down slowly and slowly and this is the most amorphous phase of the material remember. That is why there are medicines who are made up out of the finest fraction of volcanic ash. So, if you take this sample and analyze its surface area, we will talk about all this later on extremely high surface area. So, the moment you consume it in your body what will happen all the toxins will be adhering to this particle because of very high surface area and your body gets detoxicated clear. This is a simple example. Now, equivalence of this in the present day scenario is man made volcanoes. All power plants, all industries which are producing tons of contaminants in the geo environment. The similar is situation is very similar something is happening inside over here and something is happening inside over in these industries. The end process is same pollutants are being created, pollutants are going in the air, pollutants are going in the water and so on. So, this has been already addressed by several guys. I am sure you must have heard about the stabilization of uh, soft sensitive clays by using fly ash it is nothing new which has been done since. I mean I did my master's thesis for that matter in 1988 on the fly ash characterization which is almost now pristine how many years 30, 29 30 years. So, there is nothing new which we have done, but the way it is done right now and the way it was being done at that time there is a great difference. So, we will discuss this. So, most of these have been laboratory studies where soft soils have been stabilized by using fly ash. Fly ash is a good pozzolanic material, it is a siliceous material also a lot of silica is present in it. You know sometimes fly ashes might be having very high calcium component. So, they become very good strengthening materials and that is the reason in villages they use ash mix it with little bit of lime and then maybe a little bit of bio material and then 
your plaster is formed. There are ample examples of how fly ashes have been used for improving the pavement bases and sub bases. In India, the first flyover which was constructed by using fly ash was the Okla flyover in Delhi. You know. So, you, you next time when you go, this is a beautiful example of how fly ash was used to create and fly over and its approaches. Now, because this is a silty material, fly ash. If you add it to the clay, what will happen to the plasticity index? It will decrease. Clear? So, that is what the concept is. Another thing is when you add silty material or silty fraction, which is sort of inert chemically, chemically, not physically. Surface area is very, very active, but chemically it is inert. Fine? Mineralogically it is inert. So, this is the first time now I am differentiating between the activity itself and I am giving more emphasis on a system which is mineralogically inert, chemically not active, but physically it is extremely active, surface, clear. So, these are three different things all together, having something which is having a very high surface properties, having a material which has very highly active chemistry and the chemistry is responsible for making the minerals and hence having a very hyperactive minerals in the system. So, when you add these type of materials, the soil pressure decreases because you are replacing the soil basically. Unfortunately, in today's world, this type of you know luxury we do not have. In a city like Bombay where you are constructing something and if I ask you to replace the soil, where are you going to dig and where are you going to store it and where are you going to throw it? It is a big question. So, practice of geotechnical engineering changes with time and place. We do not have thumb rules which can be used everywhere. I hope you can appreciate this point. And within a city, suppose you are working in a coastal area, you know the whole concept of design is going to be different than the one when you are not exposing your structures to directly to the tidal action, fine. So, all these things and certainties make our discipline extremely complicated, but enjoying challenging. People have used lime to decrease the soil pressure, but now the question is from where you are going to bring the lime? There is a ban on mining of calcium carbonate with a natural resource, how much you will be exploiting? So, cement industry has got affected extremely and that is the reason they started using industrial byproducts because there is a ban on mining of the calcium carbonate. So, these are the questions which are coming on the way to the industrialists and they have to answer these questions. Then obviously, when you are as I said, if you are adding something which is of silty size, the liquid limit, plastic limit, plasticity index will all decrease, system becomes non-plastic. So, basically we are modifying the plasticity of the material. A system which was highly plastic is now becoming less plastic, all right. I hope you understand that fly ash being particulate material which is made up of quartz, crushing strength is very high, fine, but you cannot compact it. The reason is very simple because the particles are balls. You can pack them together, but you cannot compact them. General materials cannot be compacted so easily. People have used this for CVR modification. So, still some of you might be staying very in the West Bengal region, you must have seen uh, the roads are being constructed by using fly ash which is coming out of the uh, your thermal power plants. Which one is the power plant close to Calcutta? Kolagat, correct. So, all the way you travel from Calcutta to Durgapur, you will find most of the highways and most of the retaining walls are being done by using fly ash. So, this is a very interesting application. You know, people have stopped using the local soil, which is a resource and they are using fly ash, which when remain confined can give you very good results. 
So, nowadays construction or retaining walls you should go and see whenever you find some construction is going on go to the site and see how the construction is being done. So, they will create confinements first all right and this confinement they will fill up the fly ash and they will reinforce it layer by layer. So, this is what RE wall concept is and then you do the stability analysis and make sure that the system is going to survive or not. Fly ash cement mix, I think I have given you example. In ready mix, fly ash is mixed with the cement and then they create a material which is of certain rheological properties or somehow if I want to use a plaster at a certain time, then I can delay the formation of the bonds and I can accelerate the process and so on. I am sure that you must be aware that the use of fly ash based cement in India is growing extremely and this is where I say that uh, Hiranandani is the best example you know where most of the concrete has been done by replacing about 32 percent fly ash and I was their consultant in 1998-99 they were the leaders and when you use fly ash which are micro materials the durability of the concrete increases. The reason is very simple the type of voids which you are going to create in the concrete they get choked with very fine particles of silica and hence the gases or the fumes you know diesel, petrol, chemicals, humidity in the air they will not penetrate through the uh, concrete and hence the durability increases. So, these type of concepts have been used and there are now these are well accepted criteria IS 456 says that you can use fly ash up to 36 percent. A lot of new concepts are now coming up where high volume compacted fly ashes, self compacting cements and all these things are coming up. So, basically the whole idea is to reduce the conception of sorry consumption of OPC. You want pen? Oh, Mike. Why, why you want to reduce the consum consumption of OPC? What is the reason? Because it is made by natural resources and we want to keep that natural resources are as minimal that is, use. That is one, but it is not, it is not a correct answer. Next, why, why do not you want to produce and consume more and more OPC? Yes, use your mic, yes, yes. please use your mic. Perfect, that is the correct answer. Carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon footprint. Good, what is carbon footprint? How what much? is carbon credit? You must be hearing in newspaper, you know, last year there was a big convention in France and where India also represented itself. What is this carbon credit business? Try to read about it. So, any industry which is emitting less carbon dioxide gets credits. The way you use your credit card and then on petroleum nowadays what is happening? You get some 14 rupees, 2 rupees back, buy back is it not? So, this is the beauty. So, the moment you prove that your industry produces less carbon dioxide, government is bound to give you carbon credits which can be encashed at any time and you get more and more facilities for your industry. So, the answer is very simple, when you produce OPC, what happens? 1 ton of OPC produces how much amount of carbon dioxide in the environment? It is a big question, check it out and that is the reason OPC is not a welcome sign, ordinary Portland cement, clear? So, each ton of the OPC which you are manufacturing it will produce almost 1.5 times carbon dioxide in terms of the volume. That is the biggest problem apart from what you are saying about the mining of the natural resources and all. See biggest concern is pollution of the environment clear. So, <coughs> now this is a shift where people have started using green cement. Nobody wants to use cement anymore, synthetic cement or chemical cement. Now, people are trying to use synthetic sorry green cement or green concrete what was used by Romans 
how many years back? How many years back? 2000 plus. And whenever you get time, please go to Rome and see how did, how they constructed their buildings and pillars and beams and everything is intact. Imagine this is what durability is, <laughs> fine. So, these are the issues which are going to read more about this because this is a subject which will take you to a different plane altogether. Then you become an advocate of your country and you represent your country in international economics. Because see somebody has to represent India no about what our industries are doing, how much carbon dioxide they are emitting in the environment. So, some civil engineers should come forward and take it up as a exercise. You become an very powerful guy, knowledgeable person, read more and more norms, rules, regulations, who is violating them, how to protect them and how to help our country in becoming a country where carbon credits would be maximum. So, this is the whole agenda. Now, this is what I was talking about is something known as high volume fly ash concrete HVAC for infrastructure development. So, first thing is that uh, people are trying to use very high volumes of the fly ash in concrete and cement. I am sure you must have heard about minimizing W by C ratio. Now, minimizing W by C ratio, this is Vibhuti Das thesis. If you go through his papers, one of my students who is now faculty at NIT Surat Kal, Vibhuti Das, his papers you should read. He has worked a lot on, he is basically a concrete technologist. So, he has talked about minimization of W by C. So, minimization of W by C can be done by C tending to infinity, but that is not we want carbon, sorry, cement. So, W by C can be minimized by reducing the amount of moisture which is going to be in the concrete because water itself has become a big resource. People do not have water to drink. So, gone are the days when people used to add enough water in the concrete. So, now the tendency is W tending to 0 so that I can create high volume fly ash concrete. So, all these voids of the pores of the concrete have to be filled up with micro materials. Silica fumes, fly ash are known as micro materials, their particle sizes are in micron range. So, the whole idea is W by C should be as minimum as possible, decrease the water content. What will happen? In order to maintain the same W by C ratio, C will also get decreased. So, this is going to be a concrete where W by C is extremely less, less cement, less water, clear? I hope you understand this whole philosophy and then try to talk about the exposure conditions or durability and then see how the system is going to perform. Now, this concept we can utilize in geotechnical engineering, those of you who are working in the field of soil stabilization by using micro materials, nano materials and so on because there also water cement ratio or water and admixture ratio which you are going to add is going to be an extremely important parameter, fine. So, these concepts become very, very useful. There are several applications of high volume fly ash concrete like hydro projects which are being done where durability is very, very important. I am sure you must have heard about roller compacted concrete, roller compacted concrete. So, what do they do? They create a concrete for which the slump is very high, so that it can be compacted with the help of a roller. Near Bombay, there is a beautiful uh, project which was done by Patel Engineering Company. This is known as Palghar Dam, where the entire dam has been made by compacting the concrete. It is a new concept, roller compacted. So, they put layers and they compact it like RLC, lean concrete. So, we call them as a roller compacted lean concrete also sometimes. So, most of the projects which are in the sector of hydro, thermal, nuclear, you know these industries require very high volume contents of the fly ash because durability is more important rather than strength. 
though it is understood that if strength is more durability is going to be more, but reverse is not true that means durable system definitely will be strengthful, but strengthful system need not to be durable. So, strength is always a immediate phenomenon, it does not talk about the deterioration, deterioration is a very important term everywhere. So, most of the dams, barrages, irrigation projects which are being done, this is where you require high volume fly ash concrete. Most interesting project is the projects are marine projects where you are dealing directly with the aggressive environmental conditions in the flor, uh, form of chlorides and sulphates. So, in sea water, the concentration of chlorides and sulphates are extremely high, all right. Yeah. So, if you are trying, if your domain of activity happens to be close to the sea, ocean or saline water, then you would like to use high volume fly ash concrete, yes. Sir, just one question about roller compacted concrete. Sir, in concrete we uh, generally use needle vibrators for compacting and how this roller compacted concrete is different from the so that is what I said you missed out a point the slump has to be created in such a way that it flows very easily that means we talk about the plasticity of the concrete also. See for me the concrete is just like a plastic material the way I, I want I can roll it I can pack it. So this is just for the better compaction better placement of the concrete to achieve very high densities and that is it. You ever wonder if you start doing construction brick by brick. There are chances that between the two bricks there will be enough space through which the activities and the contaminants will migrate. So, lesser the pore size the chances are you are going to create diffusion process much more easy, you got the point. So, I do not want to create any what do you call them as construction joints in the system. And hence the best way would be you work with the materials which are easily compactable, but they give you very good strength. So, in villages sometimes they talk about uh, clay creek, have you come across this term? Why concrete always? As geotechnical engineers we can use soil crete, what is crete? some creation is it not. So, we can create something out of clay cretes, clay, we can create soil crete, you are getting the point. I need not to put cement in everything to form something of some strength and some durability. So, these are the ideas which people are getting, yes, yeah, so is this okay? We are saying you are increasing the uh, like plasticity or uh, a slump of the concrete, but at the same time you are referring it as lean concrete. How this con contracts, contradicts yeah, with so, each other? Yeah, so in my opinion, what is lean concrete by the way? In which uh, cement is very less. That is right. So, that is what I said. The whole idea is I want to achieve the maximum possible slump with as minimum water and cement as possible. Imagine this type of composition if I can create, this is going to be self compacting. What slump does? It compacts the entire thing because of the gravity itself. So, so basically the whole idea of self compacting is the moment you lay it somewhere because of its weight itself it will settle down and then I will just roll it and I make a smooth surface out of it that is it. So, you are increasing like decreasing the water as well as cement content and filling yes. it with because this is this is a lean concrete remember it is a sort of a mortar paste which is just being rolled to form a platform. This is something very interesting you should read about this uh, in the literature and try to see what type of investigations people do. So, after the construction has been done people go to the site they cut the course and then they will start doing microscopic examination of the course. What type of pore structure has been created number one? What type of porosities have been created number two? How the particles are sitting within the matrix of this type of a concrete and then what is the strength which I am going to get, clear? 
three things and the fourth is durability. So, perform a RCPT test on this or perform a test by which you can induce flow of chemicals in the concrete. The type of setup which Hanumant Rao has done, one of my MTEC scholars for determining the diffusivity of you know uh, geomaterials, accelerated modeling of diffusion process through concrete. B. H. Rao Hanumant Rao he is a faculty at IIT, IIT Bhubaneswar. So, his papers you should read, he has done a wonderful work. So, he created setups where accelerated diffusion can be studied through uh, cores of the concrete and of course, soils. So, when we are doing marine projects, they are actually high volume fly ash concrete would be required and quick setting. So, the whole chemistry should take place within certain amount of time. These are some of the applications. Why I have included this slide is because concrete technologies have done lot of work. Unfortunately, geotechnical engineers have not touched this area much and this is where the need is. People should work with these materials in soil stabilization as well. And sometimes the environmental engineering projects like we are truly speaking containments when you make trenches when you create you know slurry walls. So, suppose if I want to isolate the entire area which is contaminated, one of the methods would be you cut out the ground, insert sheet piles and fill up the rest of the space with one of the slurries of this material either bentonite or it could be high well fly ash slurry mixed with calcium or whatever. So, what it does? It acts as a sealant and nothing will flow out of it, nothing will migrate out of it. So, these type of shoes are normally done for uh, site cleanup programs where you want to decontaminate the soils. So, first thing is that you have to isolate the whole area so that the contamination does not spread in the rest of the areas. A little bit on silica fumes. This is also known as micro silica, highly reactive material, fine. And uh, basically, this comes out of the electronic furnaces, electric furnaces, where alloys are being made. So, it is an end product of the alloys which are mostly uh, dealing with silicon on ferrosilicon in at very high temperature when you use or when you process an alloy whatever residues are coming out they are basically known as micro silica or silica fumes. Normally people use silica fumes as a very good admixture for increasing the durability of concrete. The thumb rule is about 4 to 5 percent is used for choking all the pores of the concrete and hence the system becomes highly uh, durable, but it is a very corrosive material. So, it is so corrosive that if the dose is more than 5 to 6 percent, it is starts eating up the quartz or the silica which is present in the concrete itself. So, it creates voids. So, too much of dose of the silica fume might be detrimental to the health of the concrete, yes. For steel, corrosion happens in presence of like moisture. Uh, so, for silica fumes, is there any triggering thing which… Just hold on your discussion for maybe one more lecture and when I start talking about the uh, morphological features of silica fume, then please ask this question. So, I will explain to you in details. So, it is again because of surface phenomena, the system becomes so active. It is not the chemistry, it is not the mineralogy. It is the surface features which make it so active that even if a gram of silica fume falls on your skin, what will do? It will take out all the water from the skin and it will form a burnt scar there 
and it is so cancerous. So, if those of those of uh, labors who are exposed to silica fume industries, if they inhale it, what will happen? It goes inside the lungs and then I will show you the specific surface area of this material would be 20,000 centimeter square per gram. 20,000 centimeter square per gram is the surface area. So, if you inhale this material and goes in your lungs, what will happen? All the tissues will release water to it and they will die. So, when tissues die in your body, what happens? Cancer is carcinogenic, very toxic material. But then this is used in the industry uh, for making concrete. So, everything has its own you know positives and pitfalls. Fine. So, maybe you may think of using it for soil stabilization. I have not done it ever. The reason is very simple, India does not produce much of silica fume, we import it. And there are a lot of issues you know when you import silica fumes which are very light materials, a specific gravity would be 0.5. So, what will be the issues associated with a material which is so light, can you handle it, why? Yeah, first of all mixing with slurry and mixing with the concrete itself is a big question. So, you require you know we call them as three dimensional mixers, I do not know whether you have seen any of these type or not, but these are special mixers which are used to mix the concrete and uh, they give you x, y, z rotation. Second thing is as I said it is a very, very carcinogenic material. Third is the volume required to store a small amount of silica fume is so high that the biggest question is how would you import it. So, this is where I always tell a story. Suppose if you are putting the silica fume in a barge or a ship, imagine what will happen. I hope you understand the point. So, the entire ship is going to so light that it might get affected because of the rolling rocking motion of the waves and that could be very detrimental. So, there is a technique those of you who really want to become an expert in the subject, what do they do? They dissolve silica fumes in a specialized material or some fluid and then they import it or export it and then again there is a process by which you have to decant it and then sell it in the market, it is a, it's a long process. Check it out on net, it is a very interesting material and try to use it for your research. This is something very uh, extraordinary in the field of stabilization of soils, not many studies I have gone through. Well, moving on to the third one is uh, recycling and reuse of tires, rubber tires which you were talking about. So, basically this is a hazardous situation because fumes emit from the store tires, they are a fire hazard, very unsightly like if you are driving on a highway and then you see a place where most of the rubber tires are packed or stored, it is a very unsightly situation, you do not feel like you do not enjoy it. Then this is a place where the rainwater stops and then this becomes a place for mosquito breeding. This type of situation uh, you know is existing in most of the cities right now. So, curse automobile industry what happens you know these are discarded very now and then and then we do not have any place to store rubber tires. Recycling cannot be done last class we discussed because of the sulfur trioxide being a havoc. Some of the researchers in Japan are working in this area. I think I had talked about the leaching of rubber tires also in the previous lecture, carbon leaching, is it not? So, you should go through these papers and what is happening in the contemporary world related to rubber tires application. There is a professor known as Hemant Hazarika, he is a champion in uh, and he is located at PARI, P A R I, at Japan. So, he uses the, these 
rubber tires quite frequently. There are some more guys in the same list who are working on it. So the question is how to recycle them, where to stock them, what to do with these materials later on and so on. So this is where we had talked about in the previous lecture creation of CRB, crumb rubber bitumen. All right, so you can mix it with the bitumen and you can give it a finished touch. So road embankments can be done, subgrades can be done, particularly for insulation purpose in the cold climates where permafrost is a big problem, making air strips is a big problem and so on. So you require insulators, you know, to be at the base of the pavements. Otherwise, what will happen? Because of the climatic stresses, temperature stresses, the entire pavement will crack. We call them as reflection cracking. Some of you must have come across this term. Those of you who have not come across, check it on the net, reflection cracking. So, there is a lot of literature which is available in this area, where the cracks, they initiate it from the bottom of the, of the pavement and they go up to the surface. That is why they call it, they are called as reflection cracks. So, if you put asphalt which is having rubber in it, it acts as a very good binder. And the tensile strength increases and the response of the environmental effects will be very less on this material. So, in all you are, you are basically enhancing the durability of the asphalt, you are making it more resilient to the shocks or the impacts which come because of the loads, yes. What about the health monitoring of these roads? Sir? What about the health monitoring? In India, nobody has done it yet, but yes, you should take up these projects and do something. Is there any regulations for this one, the rubber tires? You should, yes, now, I think if you go through the papers which are available, their leachability is an issue. You just type it on the net and see what, you know, the quantum of work which has already been done in this area. People have created sea walls, retaining walls by using the rubber tires. And most of the wharfs and the offshore have been created so that the ship comes and hits it and this gives you a very good spring action. So these type of systems have been done. But then there are some people who are trying to challenge all these activities by saying, what are the environmental issues associated with the use of rubber tires? And that is where a big question mark is, fine. So read that and there is no point in discussing in the class because these are, you know, two sides of the coin. So if you do this, what is going to happen? If you do not do this, what is going to happen? And then you have to optimize both the things. If I just let them live like this, what is going to happen? So it is a good idea to do something and then take care of the negative aspects so that it can be implemented. It is a big concept. These are the research areas like you have to work, you have to monitor, you have to observe. Now, when you do these type of philosophies, uh, these philosophies are commensurating very well with the pavement requirements like you want to increase the durability. So, most of the time on the highways and the roadways, you are very close to the junction points or very close to the signals is the maximum rut formation which takes place because of the braking action. So, these are the places which are very good for trying rubber tires and then amalgamating them with the asphalt and creating the best possible surface. So, durability can be increased for flexible and rigid pavements. Deformation modulus can be controlled. So, you will get very cushiony effect when you are moving on these type of things. So, most of the sports tracks and astroturfs can be made up out of these type of materials. Their thermal resistance is very good and hence they can be used as an insulator for most of the infrastructure related projects. I do not know whether you have given a serious thought or not. Big question is. I want to store oil, hydrocarbons, what type of foundations I should be providing. In a country like India where the, where the surface temperature of the soil might go up to 50, 51 degree temperature. Imagine if you are putting a, 
you know a facility where you are storing oil in the tanks, what will happen to the oil? First of all evaporation will take place, cavitation will take place, third is flash point. So, all these hydrocarbons have certain flash point. So, it is not so easy storing oil itself is not very easy thing where geotechnical engineers have to step in and then solve the problems. They have to insulate the entire tanks from the sub base where temperatures are either very high or very very low both are detrimental. So, these are the issues which are now bothering geotechnical engineers how to design foundations for thermoactive systems. Thermoactive system is a very contemporary word thermoactive infrastructure. So, check it out on net you will get hundreds of papers on thermoactive systems clear. Rutting resistance as I said very close to the signals in the highways junctions you would like to provide them. So, that rutting can be avoided. Wearing tearing effect will be very less when you are putting a material like this. So, these are some of the requirements of the payments and uh, this is where rubber tires fit very well. Of course, there is one issue which I talked about which is concerning environmental technologies that has to be taken care of. Shrinkage resistance is also very good. So, once you are stabling the soils with rubber chips, rubber tires, their shrinkage will be less, shrinkage cracks will become very less. It is an elastic material, fine. So, there are a lot of advantages. The need of the hour is that somebody should use them, these concepts in the country and develop the protocols so that the entire country can get benefited. So, when you are using uh, rubber tires or CRBs, the skid resistance becomes uh, you know more. So, the vehicles will not skid so easily, these are the applications. So, I have animation which I would like to show to you this I got from Professor R C Joshi University of Calgary who did some experiments in this area. Uh, this is what they do, uh, they take a rubber tire and they splice it, cut it and they flatten it all right after cutting they will flatten it. And then uh, if you want to create a pavement, so you can have little direction and the longitudinal direction and you can start packing these rubber tires in this manner. So, this is the first layer of the flattened tires which have been spliced and then comes the riveting, you can rivet it followed by the second layers of the tires and then again you rivet it and this is how you can construct the entire embankment. So, this type of studies have already been done in some parts of the world seems to be a very good solution for quick construction of embankment number one, number two where the temperatures are fluctuating a lot fine. So, this is how you can construct the pavements and the, this technology can be proven all right. So, let us move on to the fourth industrial byproduct the glass. I think I said this in the previous lecture also that glass has become a big bug bear of the society because see our economy levels are going up, lifestyle is going up is it not. So, when lifestyle goes up and economic levels go up what happens? It gets reflected immediately in the type of waste which you produce. There are very good papers which talk about how in a city you know looking at the ways you can make out that from which part of the city and the affluence of the society can be established. So, most of the packaged food products, most of the glass bottles which are coming out of the industrial sorry from the uh, you know domestic waste are a big concern. Now, these are all non degradable materials. So, the question is where should I put them? no landfill is going to accumulate it, 
you cannot dispose non degradable material in landfills. There was a beautiful news article two days back, did you read it in times of India that the amount of waste which is generated per day in Bombay city is decreasing. Rahul did you read it? I think this was two days back. So, now MCGM says that up to last year it was 8000 tons per day in Bombay city. Now, this year they are realizing that it has gone down by 1000 tons per day which is very significant and it is about 7000 tons per day only. So, what some reports had speculated is that by the year 2025 Bombay city will be producing about 15000 tons per day of the MSW. Are we ready for this is a big question. But this is a very good sign, this is two days back I think there was a newspaper clipping. So, this may be because of the awareness of the people or there is something very interesting which has happened in the recent times, I do not know whether you are aware or not. High court has given an order and they have stopped construction of new infrastructure. So, this is something very interesting you know, how the judiciary also utilizes the concept of what we are discussing in the class. They are very contemporary issues. So, if you if you type on Google net high court order on stopping the construction in mega cities and why they have stopped is a question mark because there were guys who went to the court against this type of a decision of the court, but then judiciary has taken a decision. Are you getting the point? So, we need some people who are experts in this subject and who can go and convince the judiciary both ways or put some clauses that you know why this should be stopped and why it should not be stopped all those things can be debated in a better way. This becomes a very interesting area of uh, you know profession where you guys are required to develop yourself as a professionals fine. I am giving you a lot of ideas you know what can be done for the Okay, so, in this series the glass is creating a big problem and this has become a modern day uh, bug beer we call it, big, biggest headache. One of the application of the glass could be you can create aggregates out of it, fine. So, you collect all the glass bottles and the unused glass which is lying there and crush it and then create aggregates fine. What was the property of the aggregate which you wanted to make good infrastructure? Truly speaking it should be silica, it should have alumina clear and it should have silicate formation capacity, alumino silicates. So, truly speaking what is glass? You have already created this industry clear. So, that means all these silicates which are present in the system make it very interesting material for the placement of natural aggregates. This will be a big business and look at the list, so many applications have already been uh, you know cited by different people about the glass. So, different type of aggregates, fill aggregates, filter media particularly for uh, making you know trickling filters, replacing sands different type of specialty uses, they call it as a not asphalt, they call it as glass fault. That means, you can dope asphalt with glass. So, again it becomes very high strength material which can be utilized. So, most of the advanced countries are using either rubber chips, rubber chips are messy material. The best thing would be you crush glass, mix it with the asphalt, create glass fault and place it on the top of the roadways. During night time what will happen? You will get beautiful reflection. So, you can save electricity, air strips would be a beautiful application of this, where you can create you know trenches filled up with this material and during night time they will glow. These are the applications you have to think of you know, <laughs> something very interesting. Beach nourishment is a very good example, suppose some VIP is coming to your city and then you want to create beach overnight, 
this was done in Juhu Beach for Ganpati Visajan two years back. Uh, there is a group of uh, people who are working in this area. So, they created overnight a beautiful beach just by sprinkling you know very small particles of the glass crushed at a certain size beautifully polished so that they do not have any sharp edges and then process them and then this becomes a equivalent material to the sand. So, beach nourishment is a very interesting work which is going on right now. How would you nourish beaches? Replenishment of the beaches, particularly the places like Kerala where most of the sea coast is vulnerable to erosion, clear. So, overnight if you want to create something, this is a beautiful material. So, you can create value added products like fused glass, art glass, terrazzo, hydrophonics you must have heard of in 5 star hotels, good places, what do they do? They grow plants in not in the soil, they grow plants in crushed glass, they will put some nutrition and then these glass will be transparent soils. I do not know whether in geotechnical engineering you have come across transparent soils ever or not, you have heard. So, these transparent soils have become very useful for doing our experiments. If you really want to show this line of shear forces which are acting or the line of critical shear planes which are developing or different mechanisms if you want to show particularly earth pressures in a retaining wall, these transparent soils are of much use. You can put a die and you can you can see how the patterns are getting formed. There are so many applications we have to try, fine. This is what I was talking about beach sand, beach nourishment and so on. You type it on net and you will get lot of applications. The last is dredge material which is becoming a very big nuisance to most of the geotechnical engineers. We discussed in the previous lecture, I cannot leave my water bodies undredged, fine, because their water storage capacity is decreasing, sewage tanks we were talking about, silting lagoons we were talking about where the sewage is being uh, treated, oceans, lakes, rivers everywhere this problem is, they have to spend lot of money to dredge out all the sediments and sell them in the market. So, we were associated with Tata's who are now in a big way marketing dredge sediments and they came up, they came to us to help them in creating sellability of dredge material. See the amount of money which you are investing to dredge material, you should get returns. So, one of course, one side you are doing societal issues, you are addressing the societal problems, but the second side nobody will like to invest money unless there are some returns. So, we were studying, Rakshit was working on this project and we derived lot of applications for the dredge materials. <coughs> so, if you read his paper which he has written recently, Rakshit, I would not remember the name of the journal. You go to my website and check there Rakshit Shetty and myself. I think most probably it is in Journal of Materials ASC this year or last 2000, 2017 uh, Rakshit's paper. So, he has talked about various applications of uh, dredge materials in contemporary geomechanics, worth reading that paper. These are the photographs which I have collected for from different projects where this is a dredger, what it does is it sucks the sediments from the basin and then throws it on shore. So, this is how the whole area is getting reclaimed. One of the biggest uh, project which uh, has been executed in the recent times in India is Valar Padam and all the roads which are connecting Valar Padam from the Cochin city is a beautiful example and before that Paradeep. The entire Paradeep is on uh, dredge material where EIL was working and one of my PhD scholars was associated with the uh, this company known as Bellas Nadim. 
Dutch guys are number one in dredging. So, most of the dredgers are belonging to them. Look at this, this is how the whole reclamation is being done. So, they are dumping uh, you know dredge material. There are beautiful movies on the YouTube you can watch. So, there are several beneficial uses of the dredge materials and as I said the dredge material has become a man made resource in today's world. So, no wonders after some time people will be talking about dredge material soil mechanics because there are restrictions on using the soils. Now, nowhere you can go and scrape the top soil because it has been banned by the high courts and supreme courts of the country. Even you cannot use this material for making bricks, everywhere it is a ban, you know top cover we cannot lose. So, imagine how are you going to survive after 10 years from where you are going to bring the soil, this is an answer. So, this is how the need based concepts are developed and practiced in the science and technology which help the society, are you convinced? See the Look at this again, I mean like soil mechanics we are studying in the class and we say we will go and bring the soil from somewhere, no, nobody is going to allow you to even touch it, you have to take permission. So, beach nourishment is the one which I was talking about, creation of beaches, replenishment of the beaches, shore protection I think we discussed, then soil creation and enhancement. Most of the coastal areas are having this problem where you need to create soils. Fortunately, those who are living in the middle of the land, they cannot realize this problem, but those who are living in the coastal belt, they are worst affected. Most of the disasters are taking place because of the erosion of the soil. Then the question is from where to bring the soil? That is the question, is it not? Land reclamation, we have talked about habitat restoration. So, habitat restoration is for flora and fauna in any project where you are disturbing the nature, you have to create habitat for the species, various species which were earlier living there. So, you know geotechnical engineering projects now have become a multidisciplinary projects, different NGOs come and they start talking to you, different environmental agencies come and bother you, different international agencies come and bother you, why? There will be a natural conservation society fellow, he will come and start talking to you about you cannot do this project because his idea is if you are doing reclamation here, the species which were surviving earlier in this place, they will get affected, their breeding pattern gets affected, their survival gets affected, so many things. So, I was involved in some of these projects where we were trying to locate the sites where habitat restoration can be created, these are known as natural parks where crocodiles can come and breed, where you know species can be conserved. So, all these things are happening. So, you have to be at least aware of you know what type of unrest your projects may create in the modern day society. Then dredge material can be utilized as a construction material also. Most of these ports they are facing the problem. Remember this dredge material is going to have very high concentrations of chloride ions, ion sulphate ions, clear. So, there is no simple answer which I can come and tell you in the class. You have to collect the samples, you have to analyze them, you have to understand how to utilize these materials, what type of remediation should be done, clear, to get rid of the contaminants which are present in the sediments and then how to utilize them. But these are contemporary topics which cannot be ignored and none of the foreign companies is going to come and help you. They charge so much that it will become, any project will become unviable. So, then the question is, if I want to utilize the material, I have to understand what it is, clear and this is where characterization comes in the picture. There are a big series of characterization which has to be done in today's world. So, first thing is water content, I think I gave you a logic, water content indirectly tells you how much organic matter is present in the material. So, more the organic matter, 
more the water content and it becomes extremely difficult to squeeze out the water and store it somewhere. If it was one or two kg sample, you would have put it in a press filter press, water comes out and sediments can be you know deposited in the form of a dry powder, but it cannot be done at tons, millions of tons of the material which is being produced. Density is an issue because of very high moisture content, these materials have high bulk density, but dry densities are going to be extremely low. So, is another problem where you are going to store them. Then comes granulometry that means morphology and before morphology you talk about granulometry talks about what is the fraction of particle sizes which are present in the system. You see if you start utilizing these materials, the first question is how are you going to transport them from the location to a industrial unit. It cannot be done in the trucks, in the lorries. So, what you want to create is you want to create a conveying system. So, this is where geotechnical engineering people have to deal with mechanical engineers who design conveyor belts. Then the question is whether I am going to convey the material in a dry form or wet form or a slurry form. Look at this, you know the dimension on the scope of your work is increasing. So, imagine if you have to make slurries of your sample of the soils and then you have to pump them for kilometers long, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, 50 kilometers. How much energy is required? What will happen to the pipelines? What about the corrosion of the pipeline and so on? So, these are the issues. I mean, before you start utilizing this dead material, nobody is going to come and deliver it in your laboratory or the project site. You have to bring it from the offshore. So, granulometry means, I hope you have come across this word flow correct flow, flow index of the material. So, flow index basically defines how the particles are placed to each other, what is the shape of the particles and it is understood that spherical particles will flow better than flaky particles or angular particles, clear. So, if a system is not flowing easily, you require more energy. So, your project cost will go up because ultimately you are pumping everything sitting on a top of a, a ship in the offshore environment, clear and from there you are pumping everything in a form of a slurry. So, the cost of the project goes up. So, it is it is very important to study the granulometry of the material. Rakshit is the guy who is working in this area. His PhD is related to uh, dredging material and its utilization and then he is talking about rheology of sediments. How sediments should be transported from one place to another place in the least amount of energy. So, we are trying to understand how, how particles of soils flow from one place to another place. Then you have to do a complete test on following. So, this is where geotechnical engineering becomes more of a forensic task. You know what is forensic? Postmortem analysis, forensic, forensic examination means complete details I should be knowing. Forensic experts, what do they do? They will take your fingerprints, they will try to find out from fingerprints who is this guy, what is his age, what is her age, clear? Then they will do DNA analysis, then they will find out who is this person and so on. So, our subject is now very close to forensic engineering. So, no wonder there are so many conferences which are being held all over the world and Professor Babu is a champion in this. He, he organizes conference very frequently at ISC Bangalore forensic engineering and geotechnical engineering. What is the root cause of the failures of the structures which are geotechnical structures? Postmortem analysis. So, this is where we talk about total organic carbon, we talk about carbonate content, we talk about big list of contaminants, heavy metals. Please remember whenever you are dealing with sediments, these sediments are heavily contaminated. So, there is a paper by Sushmita Sharma, I think I told you in the last class, in the last class. Whenever you get time, please read that paper. She has discussed in details about the challenges associated with sediments 
and we gave a very interesting name to these sediments. We call them as SEGS, S-E-G-S, SEGS, socio-economically generated sediments. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful concept, you know. We said these are not the sediments alone; they are socio-economically generated sediments. So we started talking about how to characterize SEGS, how to characterize you know different components of the materials which might be present in it, then how to utilize them for different sustainable applications. That is a paper by Sushmita Sharma, I do not remember in which journal it would be. So mercury, arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, zinc, chromium, nickel, iron, manganese, all this series has to be tested by using ICP analysis. So, what is the source of these heavy metals? Ships and the oil which is leaking most of the time from the ships or sometimes voluntarily discharges which they do or whatever they throw in the sea. Now everything is banned, you know this, you spend some time on the ship and you will realize that this is a very intricate affair. The amount of cargo which goes inside exactly is measured when you come down including the food stuffs and the routine items which you carry there including the water bottles and all. Nothing you can throw in the open sea like this from the deck, it is crime, you can be penalized, you know this. So these type of regulations have been made, so but there is still the source of contamination in the sediments is mostly this. Most of the organochlorines, so I call them in short biopsy of the material. You know what is biopsy in medical science they use the word. So they take a small tissue from your intestine, uh, the body and then they do complete analysis of the tissue and then they, they diagnose the disease. So the same thing we do, we will take a sample from the sediments and we will expose it to all these type of tests. There are about 26 protocols which have to be tested, it is very time consuming process and then certify that this sediment can be used for this, this, this purpose. Total extracted, extractable hydrocarbons, this comes also from the discharge of the crude oil. Most of the ports where the crude oil handling is taking place, you know, this crude oil spills over the water, forms the tar balls. If you remember, I have discussed this earlier and these tar balls, they deposit on the sediments, they get, they become a part of the sediments. It is a big hassle and uh, hazard to the Aqualife. TBTs and DBTs are also becoming problems. I mean, you have to learn now all the protocols how to test them. We are not ready, I am still learning all these things. Then, different type of hydrocarbons which fall under the series of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. GCMS can be utilized for this. Gas chromatography with mass spectrophotometry. So, we will talk about this. These are the tools you know modern day geotechnologists are using to ascertain the material. These are expensive devices and uh, inevitable, you have to do it. There is something known as toxicity test. Have you come across ever TCLP and all those things? thin layer chromatography, TCLP or sometimes they call it as a toxicological leaching protocols. So see these are all forensic studies like if I bring a material and if I make it a part of let us say soil fill tomorrow in a retaining wall, when rains will come what will happen? The water will interact and all these species of the contaminants will flush out and they will contaminate the geoenvironment. So you have to do all these tests, these are known as toxicity tests, TCLP is normally done. Then we talk about thermal and chemical stability of the material, whether a sediment is thermally stable or not, chemically stable or not, whether it is organic or not, inorganic or not, fine. This is a very big subject as I said and I always wanted to work in this area, unfortunately 
the proposals which we have submitted to the central government have not been honored yet. The statue of Shivaji which is going to come up very close to Malabar hills, uh, this is where I wanted to do the complete project and uh, I have given this proposal to government of Maharashtra that you will require at least 50 million tons of the sediments to create the foundation pads for the statue and from where this material will come. So, my, my eyes are on the sand which is lying in Kerala unutilized. I want to bring everything to Bombay <laughs> by using good you know <laughs> pumps and by floating it. So, this is what we were discussing some time back. <laughs> Every time I land in Cochin and my eyes are on, always on the sand which they have, <laughs> it is lying unutilized, nobody is going to use it. But here we have so much of scarcity of the material. You see, this is what the ideas of a geotechnical engineers are. If we do not have something, let us buy it from somewhere else or bring it from somewhere else. So, in short, when you talk about the characterization of the material, man made or you know natural or industrial byproducts or whatever. You have to study physical, chemical, mineralogical properties and then this series is getting added up by thermal and electrical characterization. So, this has been our USP in last 10 years. We have developed lot of protocols on characterizing the material in the best possible manner. So, once you have characterized the material, you know what can be done with it. So, I will start discussing about the characterization protocols which we have developed in the subsequent classes. So, the whole idea is once you know the material in the best possible manner, I can be a good industrialist, I can be a good technologist, I can submit you a report what you should be doing with what you are producing and so on. Is this okay? Sounds good? So, the whole exercise is being done to understand how materials will behave under a given circumstances. So, if I am creating a boiler unit, I know what type of soil is required here. If that type of soil is not there, I will synthesize soil out of these sediments and create a pad on which the foundations for boiler unit can be rested. So, if you type it on net, there is something known as uh, I am forgetting the name of the sand. There is a nowadays there are some guys who are producing popcorn sands, popcorn clays. So, what do they do? They, they, they make clays uh, corns, clay corns. We have some samples in the lab. So, they, they blow it up like the corn, clear? And these corns trap air in them and then they put it in the foundation bed. So, they become the best possible granular material to dissipate or not to dissipate heat from the structure. So, if I am designing foundations for let us say hydrocarbon tanks, fine, then I can use this material which will act like a beautiful granular material. Number one, load dispersion will be there 30 degree, 40 degree. Apart from this, it will provide thermal insulation. I am forgetting the name of the sand. If you write me an email, I can forward you. Or otherwise, you just check it on net. This is known as some, oh, I cannot remember, sorry. There is a factory in, in Ahmedabad who produced this sand. So, when you are coming to do this experiment on environmental geotechnic, just show them that sand sample, clear? Popcorn sand and popcorn clays. Fine. So, let us stop here. Any questions? Can we use tire chips in foundation to prevent liquefaction? Yes, it is a good idea. Read, there is a paper also, I think, this on this, if I am not wrong. Mm. See, the problem with liquefaction is, is it is it advisable to think like this or is it not good to think like this? First of all, you ask this question to yourself. Means, sir, we are having some property in tariff that can avoid liquefaction. Please remember one thing, in short, never disturb the natural formation. 
clear. So, liquefaction zones how would you estimate? Suppose even if you are doing piling, what will be the depth of liquefiable zone? There are methods to determine clear when you do pile design. Now, the problem is how would you mix rubber tires in this zone? Are you going to remove all the soil? How expensive it would be? Forget about expenses, how would you access the site? How would you mix everything and replace it and compact it? Your projects will go at least 10 times the cost of you know what the project cost would be. So, people will think of replacing you as a expert and a consultant. <laughs> they will never come back to you again. So, the point is these type of solutions are utopian, hypothetical. Yes, in laboratory you can take some 10 kg of soil, you can make a small bed and you can insert rubber chips and you can say well I have created this. A person like me will always ask you a question, how are you going to execute in the field? Deep Where the ground water is there, deep mixing and all will not work. So, if you are really so much serious about the ground improvement, you are doing a course on that I suppose. So, the, see one of the best methods which is now gaining lot of momentum is bubble the soils. I was reading 2-3 articles, in fact I reviewed some papers recently, you must have come across. So, they uh, yeah, so they, they do bubbling of the, bubbling of the soil. This is something which is very, very recent and I have approved 2-3 papers in the recent past which I got published. I am convinced that this is a good method where you can decrease the pore pressures. And I was reading one more article maybe day for yesterday or sometime where they are using bubbling. So, if you want to reduce the pore pressure then it is a good idea to inject air into it, that is easy. So, what you have to do? You have to just drill the holes and then inject the air into it, air purging. But of course, it also has its own problems. It is difficult to mix something at such a great depth and normally the liquefaction depths would be 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters, you never know, it depends upon the deposits. So, then the question is how to go ahead with the project. Different technique or you can use other materials for that. Yeah, in situ, in, in, in situ densification has to be done. Go for tamping, heavy tamping, blasting, all that has to be adopted. This mixing concept, uh, I think people are not ready to buy nowadays. First of all, it is not possible. Any other question? Uh, sir, uh, the rubber has acoustic properties. Sorry? Acoust acoustic property. Acoust acoustic properties of? Rubber, rubber tires and we can use the rubber tires. Rubber tiles. Tire tire. Tires, uh, okay. So, rubber tires can be mixed with uh, construction material waste and can be made into a slab so that we can reduce noise pollution in our cities. Can we use it? I, I gave you a hint, the biggest problem with rubber tires is something of which, you know, which leaches out. So, the biggest problem is carbon. You see, many times we are in a fix, what to do? We know that this material can be utilized for this purpose, but then the question comes durability, long term performance impact of this material on the environment. So, this is where you know what scientists are doing, they give an idea and they counter this idea by giving another 10 logics. So, this is how the science and technology is growing. So, the more you read the more, the more you are in a fix whether to say yes or not. So, my answer would be be careful. Because there are there are issues which have to be sorted out. Again, the question is how would you create uh, a sort of a concrete with the rubber chips? Now, that can be done actually. You can mix it in a mixer and you can form a layer and you can put it. 
then comes the aesthetics okay we can do the corrugations you need not to do so much actually if you really want to create a acoustics uh, structure you can go for uh, aerated concrete that's easy to do that's easy to do so i'm happy at least this no, this knowledge and information is sinking in your mind and then you are thinking of all these areas the sky is the limit where the materials can be utilized for different infrastructure projects in the best possible manner and this is what the future is i suppose so if you have to survive in the profession you have to become a material scientist no doubts about it and then whatever i am discussing might be useful to you in the days to come this is what neo geomechanics is is this okay any other question all right then fine